All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of the Lawn Care Leaders Podcast. We have a fun one today. People have been filtering into the virtual conference room. We've got thousands of people in their seats. Picture this, guys. We are, <laughs> Brian, you've got the cat. I can't take He's it. my co-host. Oh, Your man. co-host. We are, we're putting on the second pro panel. This is January's pro panel. These drop the first Thursday of every month, guys. And we have a fun lineup. Uh, hopefully the first one, you guys got some value out of it. And I really enjoyed it. And I enjoy these guys. So in the lineup today, we've got, if you can picture it in your mind, on the panel, we've got left to right. We've got Corey Ballard with Ballard Products. We got Blake Hawthorne with It's His Turf sitting next to Corey. Next to Blake, we've got Scott Riley with Forever Green. And on the very end, snuggled up to his little cute cat in front of a Christmas tree that we've got here on the panel is Brian Fullerton with Brian's Lawn Maintenance. How's everybody doing out there? Good. Awesome. Good. Good deal. Good deal. Well, we've got for sure eight questions that I want to get through. And if we have time and you guys want to tail off on a different topic, that would be great. But before we get started, I just want to let our audience know, let our listeners know why I chose these guys. I believe these three guys are, they have the success driver. Um, they are killers in small business, killing it in their respective fields. But I also believe that they have vision for where they want to go, that they are selfless and humble. And on top of that, they couple that with extreme work ethic and dedication. And so if you're <clears throat> listening in right now and you're like, why should I listen to these guys' answers? That right there is the key. And they're getting results. You can look at what they're doing and you can also look at their results. Their output is extraordinary. So that's why we chose these guys. And uh, we're going to dive right into these questions. And just so you know as well, these are – these are listener and follower questions. Some of them have come from <laughs> our audience and then some of the panel guest audience. So we're going to start right off. And we have Freedom Landscapers chimes in and he asks what he struggles with the most is finding balance. At what point did you guys find or get better at balancing your family and your business. And so I think we'll, we'll go ahead and start Blake. Why don't we, why don't we start with you and then you can hand the mic to somebody else, but talk about work life balance. Work life balance. So it seems like it has been kind of my mantra the last few years. And unfortunately it took me crashing. Uh, I feel like crashing and burning to actually figure it out. Um, you know, marriage on the verge of, of losing my marriage to losing my family. Um, the business wasn't where I wanted it to be. It's like everything fell apart for me to actually realize what I wanted to focus on, what I wanted to achieve, um, and what the balance actually looked like. Uh, I think for the longest time, it just like I was in this spiral of you need to work, work, work to reach these goals. And when those goals weren't being reached, I just thought I needed to work harder. And so I would say, you know, first and foremost is figuring out, you know, if, if you are married, uh, realizing that. Um, that your wife, you know, is, is and should be a higher priority than the business. And how can you do things uh, every single day to, you know, to focus on that. And then next thing is, you know, do you have kids? Um, you know, um, are you a believer? Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Like those are like my, you know, my three big things is my, my wife and my family, my relationship with Jesus Christ and my business. And, you know, the biggest key I found to keeping a balance in that is not only being <clears throat> intentional with every single thing I'm doing, you know, not just like aimlessly. I used to be really bad about aimlessly scrolling through Facebook when I'm at home. I'm like, I'm at home, but like I'm going through social media. And so I had to really focus on them and be intentional, whether it was 10 minutes to play with the boys, play with them for 10 minutes. And so I figured out if I could set times of, uh, aside to be fully invested in whatever it is I was doing, then I was able to be successful. So I changed my schedule like two years ago. And what it became was I would come up to the office before the guys came in. And so like 5 a.m., nobody's bothering me. I can focus on the business and really set those goals, figure out the game plan for the day or for the week, and I could achieve the most. 
um, you know, uh, and that was like a non-negotiable. So setting these non-negotiables, the next thing was going to be, you know, dinner time. I had missed so many dinners in the first eight years, you know, 10 years that I had, I said, okay, I can't keep missing dinner. I've got to make sure I'm home for dinner. So that became a non-negotiable. I would start, I would now around 4.30 in the afternoon, I would figure out how to start wrapping my day off, my day up. And that way I could be home with the family. And then when I got home, I set my phone charger into the bathroom. So I wasn't, I could go put my phone up and I could be completely disconnected. Yeah. And then, you know, <clears throat> the big, you know, big thing for me is my faith. So every morning before I would start, I was in the word. And then I was doing my morning meeting with my guys. I was in the word. And so it just, it helped me to achieve that balance. First and foremost, focusing on God and the vision and the direction he wanted to give me, focusing on the business and then coming home and being completely intentional with the family. That's really good, Blake. That is really good, man. Uh, thank you for sharing part of your story with that. And then I also think that's some really good practical tips, you know, carving out time, being intentional with your time in the morning, making sure you're getting those important but not urgent things done first. Um, phone charger in the bathroom. So I have a follow-up question. You can answer it off air, but so then you're only working when you're, when you're going to the bathroom, like do you get tempted? So, <laughs> Brian, That's when the social media stuff happens. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Brian, let's, let's pitch it to you, man, since you didn't get a chance to be with us on the first go around work life balance and uh, balancing family and business. Uh, I, I mean, I probably can't add too much more than what Blake did. I mean, I, I love what he said. Uh, and that's just not lip service. I mean, honestly, what he said, if you break it down, like he, he was just mentioning, you got to be intentional. Uh, you can block and chunk, figure out what works for you. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also like he said, to me, it sounds like he's fo focused. Mm -hmm. And he's not all scatterbrained. He's not rushing from one thing to the next thing all helter skelter. Mm -hmm. um, I think that intentionality and that focus is going to pay big dividends. And every time I talk to somebody that seems like their life is in chaos, it seems like the tail's wagging the dog. Yeah. And I'm like, you, you can't operate life uh, and your purpose and, and fulfill your purpose by being all over the place. So I don't know if that need, if there needs to be hard boundaries. I don't know if you need to double your efforts in somewhere else. Uh, for Blake, like it, it sounded like he just needed to focus and block and tackle and set those boundaries. Uh, I, I love that. Well, we yeah. did the exact same thing last year. I mean, uh, and I hope to do some different things in 2021. You know, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with being unbalanced uh, at different seasons of your life. As long as everybody's on the same page about why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, I think everybody's like balance, balance, balance. I'm like, <laughs> look at Elon Musk and, the, and all the world's billionaires. They're, they're extremely wealthy. But the rest of their life is actually pretty poor. <laughs> yeah. Their relationship with uh, Jesus, their, like, like Blake was saying, their relationships, half of them are divorced. So I won't say go from one ditch to the other, mm -hmm. right? But at the same time, figure out what's important to you. And, you know, if, if it's important to you, I heard somebody say this a couple of years ago, then you'll find it in your calendar. Yeah. And like Blake was saying, well, my family wasn't showing up on my calendar. And it's not like they weren't important, but they weren't important at the time. Yeah. And that might be okay. That might not be okay. It just depends on your priorities. So what, what works for us is blocking, chunking, knowing that certain days we can do certain things and certain days we're not doing certain things. Like I don't do any office work Monday through Thursday. That's designed for me for Friday. I'm not invoicing. I'm not following up on things like that. I don't do that. I do it on Friday. But Friday, I'm not doing whatever I'm supposed to be doing on Monday, right? I have a schedule. Liz knows where I'm at almost every hour. And that might sound kind of boring and predictable, but for me as a business owner, <laughs> the more predictable days I can have, the better. Yeah. Um, and my last tip is I'm going to disagree with one thing that Blake said, hardcore. Um, there's no way I could have my phone in the bathroom. Uh, I would be in there for 45 minutes <laughs> outside. <laughs> Actually, to be, to be honest, that's where I do most of my office work anyway, if you guys know what I'm saying, because I'm in there for about 45 minutes. So anyway, just, that's just awesome. have fun. No, that's awesome, Brian. That's awesome. It, it seems like one of the common threads is, is be intentional about it. I've got some notes here. Happen to your schedule. Don't let your schedule happen to you. I, I hear people talk all the time about you need to get to your calendar first, Otherwise, your business and your customers will happily make your schedule for you. Temporary unbalance. And then for me, it's, it's really five to seven no's to get to a healthy yes. And so you got to decide what is, your, what is your yes? What is your healthy yes 
that you're wanting to achieve. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna downshift hard here, pass the mic, and it's a different question. That's why I'm saying we're downshifting. But it's from uh, I think it, Blake Joy Jackson, one of your one of your uh, followers says, how do I get rid of nut grass? So Scott Riley, we're going to hand the mic to you, brother. Take this one away. How do I get rid of nut sedge? Oh, man. Well, uh, nut grass, <laughs> nut, nut sedge is not the, the easiest weed to control, but there are now some pre-emergent options that are available. Mm -hmm. uh, a product like Echelon, um, generally Prodiamine, early in January or February, followed up with a Prodiamine application with Echelon, in March or April, depending on temperatures, can do a lot of good. We've had some success keeping nutgrass from coming up. It's not nearly as cost effective as just your normal prodiamine would be. Mm -hmm. But once it's up and active, a product like Pro Sedge or Sedge Hammer uh, will, do, will do well in controlling yep. it. Yep. It's a little harder to control because it's got the little bulblets below the ground. But, you know, pre-emergence are your best options. They're not as cost effective um, as normal pre-emergence. But... Um, if you are looking to keep them from coming up, there are options out there that are available now. So. Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're getting a little better about some pre-emergence options. Uh, make sure you don't pull it if you don't know what you're doing. And then make sure you over communicate to the homeowner. It takes five to seven days when you're spraying with uh, like Halo Sulfuron, which is Sedge Hammer, Pro Sedge. And then PBI Gordon also has a new product out called Vexus. Comes in a shaker can. I don't know if you guys have seen that yet do not put it in the landscape beds because it'll just torch some flowers or laropes. But in the grass study, the studies that I've seen and we did it, <clears throat> I mean, it, it works really, really well. So, all right, let's pass the mic over to Corey before he leaves. So Seth Bright, another one of Blake's followers. I've been in business three years going on four years. At what point do you stop buying equipment and stop growing for three to six months so you can build a nest egg so you're not living month to month. All my profit goes back into investments, whether it's a bait shop or more lawn equipment. I'm not sure what that means. What point should I stop and put 25K in my account and then keep going? Or does that point ever come for some people? Corey, you get the easy one. Well, I don't know if it's an easy one because I think it's you know, um, it's different for every business. Um, when you're growing a company, you're going to be, I mean, we're always buying equipment, right? We're, we're always making hopefully good choices on our equipment. Now we get smarter about what we buy. Uh, we kind of have this wants versus needs. Uh, we want new things. Do we need them? And so especially with COVID this year, we really dug in and, and tried to make some decisions based on do we absolutely have to have this piece of machinery and and just been a little more cautious there. But I think when you're growing your company, you're always going to be buying equipment. Now, saving money doesn't mean you can't grow and it doesn't mean you can't buy equipment. So if you're profitable, we always talk about knowing your numbers. We could beat that up all day. But if you're profitable you can and you get disciplined, you should be saving a small percentage, whatever number you're comfortable with, and you should be saving that the entire time you're operating. Call it 10%. Or right, I'm going to put 1500 a month 2000 a month in a kitty and I'm going to pretend it's not there. So you're building a nest egg while you're growing your company. You should be profitable enough to do that. Whatever number uh, based on your company and your business model works for that. So, um, you know, and there are, there's always a point in, in every business, I think, where you can catch your breath as well and say, you know what, this year we're going to have a, you know, maybe a flat year, or maybe we're only going to grow 5% and we're going to catch our breath. Um, and we're going to grow, maybe not top line, but we're going to grow. We're going to build some systems. We're going to do some better training. Uh, we're going to look for some, uh, maybe some new employee incentives and some, some better retention and recruiting plans. So, you know, guys talk about growing their company. When they say stop growing their company, I don't know what that means because growing your company, I think they think dollars. I think we're always growing as, as individuals. We're growing as leaders. We're, we're growing our company and our culture. So, um Every business is different, but I do encourage guys to start a savings program in the beginning. I don't care if it's 50 bucks a month or a week, just something and start building that because you'll be surprised and pretend it's not there. Put it in a separate account. Don't use it when you, you, you need to buy. Just set it up and eventually you'll have a decent nest egg there. And, um, you know, sometimes there's financing that makes sense. Sometimes it's cash that makes more sense to purchase things. Sometimes there's tax incentive, you know, incentives at the end of the year where you can take advantage of 
reducing your taxable income. So, um, you know, every business is different, but I don't think you have to stop growing to save money. That's good. That's good. Anybody else want to take the mic on that one? Um, I, I wanted to add really quick, something that helped me a few years ago, and it's a little thing, but it just, it helped Liz and I was, we would always say we would save money at the end of the month when we had money left over. And as a lot of you guys know, when you're growing an early company, like Corey said, there's not usually money left over. What worked for me, and I, I don't know who I heard it from, I wish I could give them credit, but I heard if you want to grow a savings, then you have to actually make it like a line item, like a bill that you pay every month. And it's, it's so simple, but I used to remember, hey, on uh, you know October 17th, November 17th, December 17th, my mower payment and my aerator payment was due and it's $502 a month, let's say. The, you know, I had to make it a hard line. Hey, on the 25th of every month, I had a $500 savings account bill due. And I would just have to make that payment. And if I missed the payment, I had to treat it as serious if, if I missed the payment with anything else, there'd be penalties or interest. And it was a non-negotiable. And it was really, really difficult, to be honest, for a few months. Uh, after four or five months, like many things, it's just matter of fact, and you just start doing it. Uh, so as a business owner, I always feel like money can go everywhere and everything sounds like a good idea. And that's why it's really hard for business owners to save money. Uh, but I just, Liz and I, a while ago, it was 500 bucks a month and it was a different number Then it was a different number. And also to you know, like double back on what Corey said, once the business is growing more and more and more and there's a lot of excess and overflow and all that stuff, well, yeah, then it's easy to go bank 10 or 20 grand that month. Um, but in the beginning, if, if it's important to you to have a six month emergency fund, figure out what that number is, work backwards, figure out what you need to do per month, make it non-negotiable, uh, you don't miss a payment. And, and that's really what worked for Liz and I. That actually helped us get our first little six month saving fund uh, from all of my Dave Ramsey folks. So that, you know, that was about four or five years ago. That's pretty fresh for us. Yeah, that's awesome. That's really good. Blake or Scott, you want the mic on this one? This is a good topic. For me, I, I did the same Scott's thing. Chilling. <laughs> <clears throat> I did the same thing that Corey was saying. Um, I, it's percentage wise. I work a lot in percentages. Uh, I can break it down that way. Uh, that way, if I make more money, I can put more money back. Um, and same thing, just doing it while you're growing your business. Uh, anytime I've ever tried to like, you know, uh, like Brian was saying at the end of the month, set it aside, it never happened. But if I would just continuously pour into it, it would help to build that up. And, uh, you know, for me, uh, I was figuring out if my wife was going to stay home from work and uh, be able to stay home with the kids. So I said, hey, well, can we live off of my income only? And uh, <clears throat> so we put her income in the savings. And then I said, well, I want to, if we can do this, I want to match what your income is in the savings. And then if I know if I can make that much more, then we can live comfortably with it and have it in the savings. And we were able to really get that, you know, security blanket that we wanted, uh, make that leap. And uh, so that helped us personally. And then just doing the same thing with the business, putting X amount percentage back. And uh, whenever we can throw a little bit extra towards it, put a little bit extra towards it to make big purchases like we were able to this year you know, go out and pay some cash for some new machines and some uh, new equipment that we, you know, literally have never done before. Usually it's just been some handhelds, um, maybe some trucks, um, but this year we're able to make some really good moves and it was from being set up and being prepared that way. That's good. That's good. No, the reason why I'm chilling is I just don't have the quite a good of a story as you guys have, you know, I was, <laughs> you know, I wish I had something cool that I could tell you that I did and I didn't. <clears throat> and I think for, for a good time there, you know, I, I paid the price because I didn't allocate that money to, for my savings, but I was always conscious in trying to continue to invest back into the business. So the cash flow that I had, I had what I needed. <clears throat> Me and Corey were talking yesterday actually about, you know, I'm not just a real big, big spender. So, you know, I have what I need and, you know, I don't need a whole lot. And, and, and I reinvested my cash back into the company to, to hopefully, you know, be able to reap the benefits someday. And, and, and it seems like it's working out, but I'm sure that, I, that I had to feel some pain for some time for not being able to do what these other guys have done. So I definitely think that's a great idea and, and I'm over here taking notes. So I appreciate that's why I just sit back and listen, Brian. <laughs> well, Hey, to be fair, I didn't have a savings account for 10 years, brother. So this is new to stuff to me too. <laughs> Scott, you are chilling, but I got to know, man, I see a little flicker. Are you sitting by beside a fire? 
No, no fire. No fire. Oh, okay. Okay. No. I was like, man, he's got leather bound law books. He's got the he's got the leather chair. He is he's in a nice office little cozy team. office, man. I had to come in here to my cousin's apartment just to get some good Wi Fi. So I'm super. Well, that's because you live in Kansas, man, or, or Timbuktu, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All of Kansas is a wasteland, Brian. That's how everybody pictures it. The desert. <laughs> middle, yeah, middle of a cornfield. All right. I, I, I personally want to take this question, if you guys are okay with it, um, and let's just start back with, with you, Corey, and we can hand the mic over to you. But I, I think the question behind this question is, as business owners, in your first five to seven years, maybe you're married, maybe you have a kid, and you hear the out, not even hear the outside world. Like right in our area, we have Cerner, we have Garmin. And so those are like the stereotypical corporate jobs. Those guys go in, they don't make a lot of money, but oh my gosh, they talk about the benefits. They talk about the 401k. And if I walk a mile, I get uh, extra health insurance. And so there's just this this angst that we feel like, okay, am I doing the right thing? I'm not saving for retirement. And so I would like you guys to talk about if you can remember back to your first five years, I didn't want to save money and invest into a Roth IRA. That to me felt like slowing down. That that to me felt like, so I guess where I want to take this query, sorry, I'm rambling a little bit, but we're building equity in something that is it's sellable. Like we're building equity in a brand. When you buy a piece of equipment, that's not wasted savings. Hopefully, I talk about the slingshot principle a lot, and it is going backwards to force tension for a brief time so you can launch forward. So if you're going to sit that 25K in a savings account and just be proud of yourself, like I think that's you're losing. Now, if your wife needs some security and that's your emergency fund, good for you. That's that's awesome. But I think use that money to build equity in your brand to create more margin, and then you're spitting on a, a cash off where it doesn't hurt to pull five, six, seven k out and put it into a Roth. Yeah. So um, you know, it's yeah, it's interesting. In, in the beginning of our company, I mean, and for a lot of years, uh, like I think we've all said, we we didn't make much money. I mean, we paid ourselves bare minimum, just enough to get by. One of the things I did do very very early on as we set up a, a first an IRA and then a 401k and I just stayed um, consistent to that which believe it or not a lot of guys say I can't afford to put you know three percent in and, and the truth is you won't miss it and I've been doing this a while so 25 years later it starts to add up but I do agree with you it's kind of a weird concept as business owners because my 401k I have one but my 401k is my business right and I think most guys think like that like this is my investment I can put this money over here in the savings account, making nothing at the bank, less than a quarter of a point or whatever, it's nothing. Or I can buy a working asset. And I think most of us like to think like that. Like I can buy this skid loader, for instance, or this mower, and it's gonna go out and make me money. Or I can put money in the checking account, making me zero. Now there is some level of security as we all talked about to have a little bit of a rainy day fund. And um, so I, I think it's, um, it is a t as business owners, it is tough to, to decide, um, you know, what to do with that cash. And, and you want to you want to have a savings and you want to, you know, hopefully if you have employees, you off, you know, you want to offer them, you know, a, some sort of retirement, whether it's an IRA, a simple IRA or a 401k plan, because I think you'll have better retention that way. But um, yeah, it is. It's 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 tough. Um because we want to put our money to work for us. You know, the one thing we, we talk about that, that I struggle with is, is, you know, using the, those funds correctly. You know, I, I jokingly say a lot and, and jokingly, but it's true, like on our podcast and, you know, a guy goes out and he gets a little success and he buys that $80,000 quad dually Ford jacked up with rims. And I think, I see three work trucks. I see you could have went out and got three $30,000 F-250s and those would have made you money. Instead, you look cool or feel cool and feel like you made it because you're driving around in this, you know, $80,000, $90,000 diesel jacked up quad cab dually. And, and so I think it's buying the right things, using your money wisely, um, have a good CPA or a good mentor around you. We talk a lot about that, obviously. So, um, but in the beginning, we just worked. Um, and I, I think that's probably the same story for most of us. Um, 
I wasn't thinking about a retirement. I wasn't thinking about a 401k. I'm glad I started one when we did, but uh, um, I was just trying to get the work done, get the bills out, collect the money, and then see if there was anything left over. And, and on the last topic was the same thing. We were like, well, this month we'll have a good month and we'll save some. That just doesn't work. And I love what Brian said. It, you just put it in. It's a line item. We just, it's a, it, we know that, you know, every month we put in X, um, you know, and for some reason, if you can't put it in, it's, it's, you got to figure out, okay, what am I doing wrong in my business that, um, and you can build your pricing model around that too. If it's, especially if it's a percentage, we know that we need a 1%, you know, 1% of every job is going to go into this fund. So I don't know if that answers your question, Britt, uh, kind of a long one, but, um, you know, that's, well, that's, that's my thought. No, that's really good. I, I appreciate you sharing that. Anybody else want to want to add on to that or you want to move on to the next question, guys? You can go down that one for a long while. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, <'cause laughs> there's like there's like the, the conservative answer. Then there's like the hardcore business answer like Corey's talking about. Then there's like the Robert Kiyosaki people answer. Then there's like the Dave Ramsey people answer. I, I, I think me personally, broadly speaking, before you set sail, like, chart your course, figure out like your philosophy. Um, you know, Dave Ramsey might say, have a retirement, have a Roth IRA, have a, have a 401k. Uh, you read Robert Kiyosaki and he says, saving for retirement while you're building a business is the dumbest thing you could ever do. You need that money to grow your company. Mm -hmm. Which one's right? Mm -hmm. Whoever you subscribe to. <laughs> yeah. where, where people get in trouble is when they jump ship 10 years into the business career or their personal career. Right. So figure out your financial philosophy, then you could probably start getting nitty gritty on those details. Like Corey was saying. That's good. That's good. Yeah. There. And, and, and at some level you have to implement forced scarcity during your first, first few years of business. Cause as you get some level of success, like Corey was talking about it, profit first book talks about this a lot, the Parkinson's law, you're going to use the amount of resource that's available to you. So you make 50K in your business, you're going to use all 50K in some form or fashion. And guess what? You make 70 or 100 the next year, you're going to use all that 100. And so you've got to force scarcity even when there's extra cash on the table to make sure that you're putting money in the right buckets. So, all right, guys, let's, let's move on to the next one if you're all right with it. And this one, he's got two questions. So we'll see if we, uh, if we can knock them both out. But what is one service you would add or have gotten into sooner that is super profitable, like fertilizer, aerations, or adding a landscape crew? And this comes from Helping Hands Property Care, a guy that follows Scott Riley over at Forever Green on Instagram. So, Scott, I will let you tee off with this one, my friend. Well, <clears throat> services to add, you know, the a couple of things I would look at would be if you're adding high profitability, and something that that you can that you feel that you can sell. Um, for us, an example would be something like aerations. You know, we went out and purchased uh, a Z plug, which was a twelve or thirteen thousand dollar aerator. And <clears throat> that same very year, because we were intentional about trying to sell those services, you know, we sell fifty grand worth of aerations. So the next year, your equipment's paid for, so you don't have any more cost of goods other than you know, necessarily your, your labor cost and your fuel and stuff like that, which aren't your cost of goods. So your profit margins begin to go up and, you know, to take a 12 or $14,000 hit up front sounds like a lot, but if you know how to, to sell your services to your customers, uh, it's a pretty easy sale to make. It's just basically saying, Hey, Mr. Jones, you know, I'm going to be in the neighborhood next week, air rating some yards. And I thought that would be a good idea. And I want to see if that's something I could do for you. And then if they don't know what it is, you explain the service, same thing golf courses to do and release compaction and thickens up the lawn. And, and I just thought it would be a good idea. And, and then I just want to see if I could do that for you. You always ask for those sales, but it comes back down to sales. Now, if you're not willing to get out there and try to sell those services, 12 or $14,000 aerator can, can cost you. Hmm. But, you know, being super intentional, another example would be like, we sell flea and tick applications. You know, these are just um, a contact insecticide that we're spraying that's, you know, it's not super expensive to apply. It gives and yields great results by that. It does a great job. And, um, you know, but again, it does those, pro, those services at times, they sell themselves, but most times 
somebody's got to be pushing and shoving out in the marketplace to get those sales. Mm -hmm. So, you know, focus on something that you can make have high profitability and something that you can get behind and sell. And uh, that's just some low hanging fruit that we found in our business just by simply making those calls to our active accounts, which is, is our low hanging fruit, our best customers, you know, and, and they, they already trust you and doing business with you. So <clears throat> those are just a couple of examples for me, but I stay to high profitability and something that we can, that we can, uh, that we can sell. That's good. That's good. Blake, why don't you, why don't you take the mic on this one, adding new services, when to do it and how do you, how do you pick which service you're going to add? All right. I mean, I'm going to piggyback right off what Scott said. Uh, I like the thing about um, just making sure it's high profitability, making sure it's something that you believe in, that you can stand behind, whether it's a product or a service. If I believe in it and I use it myself and I would pay money myself for it, then I have no problem selling it. And so that's the biggest thing for me. And then also education. I uh, figured out the biggest tool for selling is education. Educating my customers about it um, has helped me always in selling it. It doesn't make it feel like a sales pitch and allows me to be able to, um, you know, sell a lot of new services because I'm just educating them on what we do and how it can benefit them. And so, uh, but as far as when to add that service, i uh, I'm going to stick true to, to what's worked for me the last few years. And that's adding the service in the winter, you know, not in prime time, spring or fall, figuring out, learning it, um, you know, get everything ready to roll, um, testing it in those months. I know there's some things that, you know, like the insect control and different things, you know, as far as that, that's out of my wheelhouse, but I know you can't do that in the winter, uh, you know, figuring it out, you're going to get your better results in the, in the spring and summer. But, um, you know, as far as any other service, whether they want to get into, you know, get into mulching or, you know, if they just want to get into light landscapes, you know, there's different things that you can do at different times of the year to add that service to your business. Um, do that in the off season and make sure that you stick to what you do best in the, you know, in the spring to, uh, to make the most profit possible. But um, if you are going to add a new service, make sure it's something profitable and not just something that looks cool from the outside. I added pools and large outdoor living. It looked cool. And, you know, I, I paid for it literally. So, uh, you know, just make sure it doesn't just look cool. Make sure it's extremely profitable. That's great advice. Great advice. Anybody else want to take the mic? Uh, just real quick on that too. Um, I like what you guys said there. And um, you know, don't let the customer dictate what services you add, you know, just because a customer says, you know, I really wish that, you know, Scott, I really wish that you guys could, uh, clean my windows while you're here. I really wish that you guys could, uh, you know, stain my deck or power wash my deck. Oh yeah, we could do that. You probably could. Um, so make sure that, uh, you know, again, that you feel like you are going to be an expert in that service, uh, do your research, understand the pricing, um, we certainly got into some businesses that our customers requested. I've mentioned several times, a lot of our clients were saying, I don't know why you guys can't sweep our parking lot. You put down the salt, you put down the sand. Now we have to pay another company to sweep our parking lots every spring. We said, well, we'll sweep your parking lot. So I went out and bought two tenant sweepers. We lost our ass. We're not, we don't know, we're not in the sweeping business. Mm -hmm. So we let our customers tell us what they needed and we did not run through the process very well. And, and so you know, but there are some advantages. If you have a hundred customers and the average customer spends $500 a month with you, are there other services you can do for that client to maximize the value you get out of each client? And they could be simple as, as pruning, as long as you're qualified, it could be irrigation service. It could be a perimeter pest control. If you're doing the weed control and lawn apps, and maybe you can do a perimeter pest control and, and trying to bundle services to get the most out of you know the existing clients you have but again that knowing when to say no um but if a client asks you to do something that doesn't mean you're in that business and we've been, we've screwed that up uh many times where we're like god we get, we're getting a lot of requests for power washing well we can power wash and and again we went out bought a truck with power washer and um that's not our business model it's not who we are we weren't good at it um we you know so be cautious when you uh, when you add services to make sure that uh, it fits your model, you know what you're doing, you're comfortable um, with the pricing model, you're qualified, and that you believe in the services. So that's all I got. Good. That's really good, man. I love that. I love and, that. And just just you know, the, the one sentence alone about not letting your customer dictate what services you add is huge. And that's it's 
it's very easy to sit here and say that, but we've all been there first year or two and you need <clears throat> money. And so you just end up chasing every rabbit. And before you know it, you're like, okay, what am I, a, am I a gutter cleaning business? Am I doing roof jobs? Am I also doing fences? So we've all been there. And so I, I think that's, I think that's awesome. Brian, were you going to jump in? Uh, I think that was Scott. Oh, Scott, were you going to jump oh, in? I'll just say just from, you know, I think as years have gone by, I've done, I've been a little more patient and not just always chase the, the shiny object. Mm-hmm. Like you said, if you chase, you know, two rabbits, you're guaranteed to catch none. Right. Yep. So for example, uh, starting this year, or, you know, we thought about sanitation services, you know, and that was something that <clears throat> really came up and, and, and you know what is worth thinking about. And we've done some of those, but we didn't know how much, if we wanted to try to really promote and invest and, you know, just for me, the core of what we do, I don't want to veer too far away from that. And, um, saying no to that every time you say yes to one thing you essentially say no to something else Mm. so i just try to be real conscious about what i'm saying yes to and don't always (laughs) because early in my career i would have jumped all over that stuff because Mm. it would have been a fast buck but it it distracts you takes you away from from your niche and what you do best and it actually can can you know um can cost you in the long run with with uh, the service you provide maybe not providing as much value as you normally would if you're focused on what you do best. Yeah. Yeah. That's really good. That's really good. Yeah. And I I've started things that made me a little money, but I realized, Hey, this isn't our niche or it's not scalable. One thing that I always try to keep in mind is, is it going to add value to our client base? Like, is it truly going to help them? Because if it does, you're probably going to be able to sell it. So that's, that's step one. And then I, I say, is it scalable? Is it scalable within the system that we've built? Because people ask me all the time, like, well, why don't you start mowing? Why don't you start landscaping? You have all these clients, but it's not, it's going to add value, but it's not scalable within the system that we've built. And then I usually, I I usually for profit, I say, is this required extra education from our part? Because if so, it's going to add profit. Is it going to be extra professionalism? Is it an extra technical skill or is it going to save my client time? If it has more than two of those four, usually you're going to make some profit out of it and it's going to add value. It's scalable. It has two of those four, save my client time. It's going to add a technical skill. It kind of fits within your business. So that's kind of what we run it through. So, all right, let's move it on. Corey, I'm sorry, but I got to sling one right back to you. This one's pretty specific. So you can sit with it for a couple minutes and uh, then we can move to the next question. But it says, I have an idea for a product within the green industry, and I'm currently working on the patents. How does one get into this field, and is it better to outsource the manufacturing, do it in-house, and what are some pros and cons of both in the manufacturing and patent process? I'm in Canada, but often things are similar. Okay, um, interesting. Yeah, you know, I'm not a huge fan of patents. Um, We have some products that are patented. Um, I don't patent products today, um, only because we've been knocked off so many times. So unless it's super proprietary, like, you know, sometimes it's pharmaceutical or software, um, you know, patents are expensive. Um, So unless you have something insanely unique, you know, cause I can take a product and we can make two changes to it and your patent's no good. So um, I think guys in the old world, like gotta get it patented so nobody knocks me off. You know, my belief is, you know, create a great product. Um, and then if you market it well, show how it can be used uh, practically in the field, um, which is kind of our model. We try to show how products are actually used in the field um, and we market them. I, I feel like we can sell them now. Um, As far as the manufacturing of the product itself, um, I would encourage most people to outsource the manufacturing unless you have the capacity to truly, I don't know what product this guy's working on, but unless you truly have the ability to build them. I mean, maybe in the beginning, you want to build the first 50 or 100 to really do proof of concept, you you know, because there's a difference between cool products and products that Mm -hmm. actually sell. I see a lot of products. I'm like, that's pretty cool. I won't buy one, but it's pretty cool. And so um you know getting teamed up with a good manufacturer typically um they're going to have systems in place that keep the price down um you know and you know quality control um there's just i just don't know again i don't know what product they're looking at but 
Um, you know, we, we certainly help a lot of companies. I'm not advocating for him to get a hold of me by any means, but we have a lot of people that send me products. I got two or three sitting on my desk right now. I take it. Um, I send it off to a manufacturer. I have them build a prototype. We test it. And then we work with that person, whether they want to manufacture it and let us sell it or whether we want to buy the product and sell it ourselves. And um, so there's a lot of steps in there. You know, there's a lot of good products out there. Um, the, the hard, you know, the, the real challenge is not a good product. It's how do you really market it? Um, who's going to manufacture it? Who's going to warehouse it? Who's going to ship it? What's, you know, what's customer service look like? What's warranty look like? Um, you know, and so um, I encourage anybody with great products to, to certainly try to bring them to market if they think it's going to help elevate our industry. Absolutely. But uh, um, I do think people get a little caught up in this patent thing. And I, I don't know, I, I go back and forth. Uh, I've spent a lot of money on patents. Um, one of the first products we made was EasyGate. We patented it and then we got knocked off. I, I sued them. We lost. So I spent a ridiculous amount of money. You know, they took our round tube, made it square. They took our roller assembly and made it different. And then we lost the patent. I mean, same exact concept, same exact product in theory, but they made two structural changes to it and our patent was no good. So um, I go back and forth on patents. I just, yeah. I'm, unless it's something crazy and uh, that I shouldn't say crazy, but that, that really, that you can really protect it. Um, I you're just, kind of yeah. you're kind of taking your eye off the ball in a way. You know, you're looking at the crowd, you're looking at your competition, you're worried about defense instead of offense, right? And there's there's very yeah. few mulch mates out there. There's very few first movers that are going to just completely <laughs> transition everything that we think about within this certain segment. And I, I think it's more less about like the idea itself and more how am I going to implement this, produce it, and actually sell it. Is is kind yeah, of. We we get that a lot where guys say, I can make that same thing. And I'm like, Oh, sure you could. Yeah. But then you gotta, you know, someone's got, you gotta, you gotta get them built and you gotta set up a website and a warehouse. And then you gotta have them, you gotta sell them and market them and warranty them and take service call. I mean, so yeah, there's, you know, there's a lot of people that say I can do exactly what you're doing for it. And I'm like, man, have at it. Do it. Um, yeah. the, the, building the products, the easy part. Um, there's a lot of great products that have failed millions of great products that have failed. And if you get on the patent website, Man, there are millions of incredible patents right now that have never sold on the market because um, yeah. they get so caught up and I got to get this product patented. To your point, um, I think there's something to be said about being first to market, having a high quality product, marketing it um, and getting it out there to the public. If somebody knocks you off, I don't know. I don't really care that much. If somebody else makes another product uh, similar to ours, I don't, you know, that's okay. You know, we just, as long as we have a good quality product and can market it. Um, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. So, um, that's good. That's you know. good. And, and, and on, uh, as we transition to this next one, I would just say, listen to Corey's passion. I asked him a simple question. You better make for dang sure whatever you're creating and getting ready to manufacture, you're passionate about it. Cause if you're not as passionate as Corey, that's why he's beating you. It's it, yes. You have to have a good product. That's step one, but then you gotta be passionate about it. You gotta love it. And it's gotta be your life. So, okay, next we're going to get out of, out of nuts edge, out of manufacturing, out of finances, get a little relational. So we'll pitch this one over to you, Blake. And uh, then you can hand the mic to, uh, to Brian after that. But what piece of advice can you give me to better help communicate with my wife or let's say spouse that it won't be like this forever? And what can you give me to make sure I keep in mind that she needs to see progress in my time with my family, sometimes even more than money? Whew. Oh, you're muted, Blake. Brother, you're muted. There you go. Oh, my bad. I, said, <laughs> I was saying that I feel like you just pulled that out of my journal. That, that seemed like the broken record that I played for years and years and years. And uh, <clears throat> I, the piece of advice I would give you, um, instead of doing the same, you know, they say that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results, do something different. Um, if you're doing the same thing and you're continuing to have to tell her it's not gonna be like this forever, then do something different, you know, make a change. Um, but the biggest thing is becoming way more intentional with the time that you're spending with them. 
I was present, but I wasn't intentional with the time. I wasn't having quality, um, quality time with them. And it's because I was just being intent. Uh, I wasn't being intentional with that, with that window of opportunity. And, and it feels so, it feels nasty kind of to say like, you know, this window that I have with my family, but you're only given 24 hours in a day. And how are you going to spend that? Um, you know, and so I, I sleep about four hours a day. And then that gives me about 20 hours to do, you know, business, family, um, you know, God, recreation, like all that combined into, into that um, social media, like it's, it's a lot to do. So uh, the piece of advice would be do something different, uh, you know, and start to be super intentional with them um, because it's not about the money. At the end of the day, it's not about the money. Um, it's about having those relationships with them. I, 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 my anniversary was, uh, two days ago. Uh, we've been married eight years, been together 12 years. And I, we had the talk. We took it. I took a day off from work. Uh, we drove four hours, uh, to silver dollar city, had a day with the family. I drove home. So I got up at 4.00 AM, got home at 2.00 AM. We were gone 22 hours, um, just to have an intentional day with the family, uh, because that's all I could really fit in with end of year taxes. Like, I felt like that was making the most out of one day opportunity. Um, but with that, me and my wife got to talk a lot and we talked about how, you know, we were broken. We were on the verge of divorce and how God restored that. But the biggest thing that, you know, for her was finally seeing a change in me. It wasn't just empty words. And I was listening to a devotional that morning on my way up there. And it said that true, uh, a true apology has repentance and I remember always saying, hey, babe, I'm sorry. And I would just go back to doing the same thing I was doing. I would just go back to working the same way I was working. I would go back to saying, I'm doing this for us. And I would get mad at her because I was working so hard for the family and for <laughs> these goals and dreams and aspirations that I had for the family. And I was just missing out on time with them. I was missing out on uh, T-ball and all these different things. And this year I kind of stepped back. I said, you know what? I'm going to work four days a week, four and a half days a week. We're going to go camping. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to coach T-ball. I'm going to do all these things, you know, um, with the family. And I put myself on payroll. That was making myself a line item. And we did less revenue than we have in the last several years, but we made more profit. And I, you know, it's crazy. But I think what it was is I was so determined in those four days a week to just execute and make the most profit as I possibly could, that it gave me the time to take Saturdays off and to take Fridays off with the family and to have that time with them. And I wasn't being drained from this, um, this you know, failure of I'm not reaching the goal I want. And it was like, OK, Friday came that can wait till Monday. I'm going to be intentional with them. And then that rejuvenated me and got me back ready for Monday. But, you know, I don't want to sit here and lie and say that it's, you know, it's uh, social media has made it to look like it's been picture perfect for the last 12 years. Like, no, two years ago, we were broken and on the verge of divorce and God restored that. And so, you know, I'll, uh, I'll kind of pitch it over to, to Brian now. Like, but before Brian starts up, I just want to say, man, good for you. I, I know your story. I've heard it a couple times and uh, I'm, I'm proud of you and proud for you. That's, that's awesome. That, that's really cool. I appreciate that, brother. Brian, go for it, man. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, it's like Blake said, there's, there's a bunch of things you could work on. We all can work on. Um, I, I would venture to say that all of us in this zoom, you know, webinar, we've all had ups and downs. We've had to figure out what works for us. Right. Um, and we're always, like Blake said, refining that process. Um, you know, I, I do a lot of coaching calls and I talk to a lot of folks on this topic about young couples trying to build businesses. And I've always, uh, a lot of like commonalities that I've seen are people saying like, my wife doesn't get it. My wife doesn't know. My wife doesn't understand. And frankly, if we could just man up for a quick second, talk leadership, that's on you as a guy. Why doesn't your wife understand? Why doesn't your wife know, right? You have to spend time helping your wife understand the vision. You have to spend time helping your wife understand why we're spending money, why we're not going on vacation. You have to help her understand. 
Now, here's something I also throw over to the wife. The wife also needs to understand that if they want to commit to what the family decide is, is important, then the wife is going to have to come to the table with things too. You know, my wife is not a trophy wife that sits around and does nothing. That's the most absurd thing I've ever, I could ever hear about my wife, for example. My wife is a kick butt girl behind the scenes because we've committed together. So what does that mean? That might mean we have different roles, but she has to make sure that she's mastering those roles while I'm mastering my roles because we both set a, a goal <clears throat> as a family to accomplish a certain thing. It, it's one of those things where how do you, you know, get your wife on board? Well, number one, I mean, I know that I had to own up. I know I had to man up. I know I had to start leading and I had to start actually winning. It's really hard for a wife, <clears throat> in my opinion, to start believing in their boyfriend or their fiance or their husband <clears throat> when the when that guy keeps making bad decisions, he doesn't figure out his business, he doesn't treat it serious, and he prioritizes things like softball, like Blake was alluding to, versus getting into the, uh, his books and figuring out his numbers and how to be profitable. There, oh, I'm an entrepreneur. You're an entrepreneur. Find me an Instagram account for anybody who's not an entrepreneur. <laughs> I mean, it's like the cool thing to say, but the reality is like, are you making money? Are you a businessman? Are you a business owner? Do you treat it serious? Like, we're all doing social media and it sounds light and fluffy. And like Blake said, Instagram's a freaking highlight reel. But you know what people don't see, which I can't even document the best I can with as much content as I put out, is the hundreds of conversations Liz and I have about little tweaks, little conversations. What are we trying to do? Why are we doing this? Um, I, big takeaways. I think the ladies, they want to think short term or typically they think short term and they need those checkpoints. That might be a weekend trip. That might be a quarterly thing. That might be an annual win. Uh, you got to do that with your family. That's what I've noticed. Mm -hmm. I think guys really uh, excel at having that long-term vision. Hey, five years, 10 years from now, we're going to have the boat, the yacht, the Ferrari, the, the house. Okay, but if you got to understand the paradigm here. If you only think short-term, you're never going to think long-term. And if you only think long-term, your wife's not going to be there in 10 years to join you on your boat. Right. So, so what I've noticed is that guys need to stop thinking maybe so 10 years out, maybe dial that back a little bit, just my observation and just say, Hey wife, what are we trying to do this quarter, this month, this, this year? Mm -hmm. And I would also implore the women and my wife, and we have, we, we treat our company like we are board of directors. It's we, we take emotion out of this conversation sometimes. And I'm saying, Hey, what are you going to come to the table with? And she says, well, I'm going to do this, this, and this, and we have accountability. Wow. There's a thought. So we don't just, we're not just husband and wife, we're business owners. And if, if you have a business partner who's not coming to the table with what they committed to do, well, why would you want to be in business with that business partner? Yeah. You're like, well, that's my wife. I get it. That's where it gets dicey and dynamic. Amen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but at the same point, like Liz knows she's got things to do. I know I got things to do. We all make mistakes. We fight. There's holes in the walls, you know, time to time. We've, we, things get thrown. We've all been there. But I think what helps the most is people communicating, being on the same page. It goes full circle to what we talked about at the very beginning. Why are you doing what you're doing? What's your priorities? What are you trying to do this year? You know, is it a growth year or is it a relationship year? Is it a this year? Is it a that year? Like what's, what's the focus? What's the priority? Um, just to sum it up, I think guys need to stop thinking so long-term. Don't, don't stop thinking long-term. Just remember that if you're thinking, you know, 55 years old, we're going to have all this stuff. Your wife might not grab your coattails for 20 years and go through all the crap she's going to have to go through. Yeah. You know, maybe she wants a new coat or new purse or just a family vacation for crying out loud. Like Blake said, I mean, most women are quality time. I, I, I will totally double down on what Blake said. Being, being there and then being there are totally different things, right? Like being present, I mean, actually listening versus just hearing right? That kind of stuff that, that pays big dividends. So that's just what I found works for me. I'm not, I'm not the marriage guru, but I mean, after talking to like hundreds of people, I've found common denominators. And then I'm also trying to model after what I see working out there, guys like Corey and, and whatnot. Uh, that, that's just what I've noticed works as, as entrepreneurs and, and business owner couples. Guys that Blake and Brian, that is, that is so, so good. That is so, so good. I know I'm sitting here learning and taking notes and, I know the guys listening to this, it's going to help them. It's, it's, it's going to help them in their business, but it's going to help them communicate with their wife and uh, 
It is so good. What one thing that's funny is my wife sometimes have, has to give me like an analogy. She was like, babe, you are literally, you are two or three blocks away from me. And oftentimes I just want you to like hold my hand and get the girls across the street with me. And then I'm fine with you running ahead a block, but occasionally you've got to come and meet me where I'm at. You've got to communicate. Hey, how are we just getting to the next corner? I also love so what you good. said about like just buying a coat. I, I, I think as men, we want to provide so well that we often think it's the house or it's the car or it's some big grand trip or going on a yacht. And it is the little things. I, one big milestone for us was remodeling our bathroom in our 900 square foot house. And I personally, deep down and still salty about it because it was a waste of money. I'm like, we are not going to be in this house for two more years, but it was important. Like it was, that was my wife's version of a win. Like I don't have to go step into a puke green colored shower with no tile on the floor. And it's just like, that was a win for her. Um, That's awesome, man. That's really awesome. Yeah. The, the other thing that I was going to ad lib on you guys both touched on it was communicating and then letting her just sit with it. I've screwed this up a billion times and I'll probably do it today, but I want her to understand like, Hey, the podcast is doing this green again's doing this. And then I go straight into what are we going to do? What are we going to plan or how are we going to fix it? And she just like a flip switches and she will immediately talk about something else, ignore me or get pissed. She likes to sit with it. Like she likes to feel it. She likes to think about it and then come back. And when she comes back like a week later, it is always with gold. It is always with the best heart for whatever issue we're dealing with. It is always with a better plan. And I, I just want to say that two cents because I struggle with that. I want to do fix or plan and she just needs to sit with it. And then Scott and Corey, I'll let you guys jump in here. But one thing that is absolutely not fair that I do is I'm with my family, but my head and my heart are somewhere else. My heart is in the business. My head is on payroll. My head is on a customer service issue. And I still, to this day, struggle with this. I am, I'm actively putting in triggers to make sure I have a buffer between me and work constantly. Is it putting the phone in the bathroom? Yes. Is it sweeping the floors? Is it listen to a fiction book or worship music on the way home? What is it? But it is not fair to your spouse for you to be there, but your head and heart are somewhere else. So I'll, I'll pitch it up to you, Scott, and then Corey, you can take it and wrap us up on this question. Well, you know, I tell you, for me, it's hard. <clears throat> I mean, it's, it's not hard for me to hear, but because I have the same <clears throat> challenges as the rest of these guys do, you know, there's as entrepreneurs in the audience that are listening or, or seeing this, I mean, this is, this is real life. You know, we have the, 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 the wife and the kids and the same things that, that they may have. And, and these are the sacrifices that business owners, they have to make. And then these are the things that they have to juggle. And, you know, me and my wife stepped before the Lord and we said, you know, for better, for worse, the richer, for poor. And we meant those words. And, um, you know, she supported me and she's just, you know, she's not in the business with me, but she's just been the biggest support to me. And, and without that support, I can't imagine the weight it puts on a business owner, a leader trying to lead his people at work and have this thing going on at home. So I think it's so important to make sure you get it right spiritually first and then at home second. You know, once we get those two things in line, then I think we can move on. Yeah. And one thing I loved what, what I'm hearing from, from Blake over there is <clears throat> Blake's kind of sort of created time. You know, time stops for no man, mm -hmm. right? And, and Blake is, is saying four hours of sleep. You know, I need a little more than four, but I don't need eight. Mm -hmm. And I, I get going early to create a little more time for myself in my life that I can spend in other areas to add value to my life or my family's life or my spiritual life or, or my business life. So yeah. um, just creating that time, I think is something that, that anybody can do because everybody has the same amount of time as everybody else. Yeah. Uh, you can spend your time in bed sleeping, or you can get up and get going. Yeah. But, you know, in order to, to have that balance that we all need personally, 
to, 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 to live a happy life and, and be fulfilled, you know, you got to get all those things right too. So those guys made some awesome points and, and, and I really can't fill in any more than just, just that, just, uh, just creating that time and, and everybody has to make sacrifices. And it's so important that, you know, your wife supports you in what you're doing, or, you know, it's going to, it's going to be, it's going to be tough. That's good. That's good, Scott. That's really good. Appreciate you sharing that. Well, on the topic of time, I want to make sure you guys are all super busy. I want to respect your time. We're about eight minutes past nine right now. Is everybody doing okay? Or do we need to wrap it up? How are you? You got five, 10 more minutes? I'm good. Sure. Okay. Okay, we will, uh, if everybody's good then, Corey, we will kick it to you for the last question. And then if we can, guys, keep it keep it two to three minutes on this response. Um, again, I just want to make sure we respect everybody's time. Last one is super simple. What are your personal New Year's resolutions going into 2021, Corey? Boy, that's a tough, that's a tough one. Um, you know, Thanks for taking this one, Corey. <laughs> I, I always pitch up the quote unquote easy ones for Corey to start with. Right, right, right. Um, you know what, guys, this is going to sound kind of cheesy. I don't do resolutions. Um, I try to live my life the way I want to live it every single day. Um, I, I don't, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a creature of habit and discipline. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm a beast. So I don't 65 y'all. I just, I, I just try to stay very, very consistent. Um, you know, you guys talked, you know, about some good topics here at the end and, and I struggle with the work-life balance, just like everybody else. I can preach it really, really well. Um, but I struggle with that. Um, luckily I have a, a supporting wife that is totally on board. Um, but I, you know, I struggle with that as well. So I don't really have any resolutions. I mean, um, again, I, I don't, I don't make excuses. I try to hold myself very accountable. I'm, I hold a lot of people around me accountable, which I'm hard on people. And I know that. And um, so I guess there's one resolution I, I'm going to, I try, I, I, I just was talking about our staff and I need to remember that, that they don't love this company like I love it. And I, and I was frustrated. I have, everybody took today off. Right. And, and they took today off cause it's, I guess it's new year's Eve and I'm in here. I'm the only one in the office and, and I'm frustrated. We have, we have product that just showed up and um, sorry guys, my phone rang. Um, and I need to remember that they're not me. Um, they don't love this company. It's not their baby. Um, they have family, they have PTO. They get to use PTO when they feel the best use of their time. And I get really, really frustrated. Like, what do you mean no one's going to work tomorrow? And Lindsay's like, uh, they put in for PTO. They have family in town. And I'm like, that's bullshit. You know, and so I need to um, recognize that better. So I guess if there's a resolution, I'm going to work really hard at, at recognizing that, um, you know, that, you know, I, they're not going to be here Saturday when I'm in here. And that's just okay. And, uh, um, but this is my baby. And uh, it's what I do. It's what I love. I'm passionate about it. Um, I, I'm not the smartest guy, but I just try to, I just try to put the work in day in and day out. And uh, um, so that's all I got. Cool, man. Cool. Brian, let's kick it to you and then you can hand it off to Blake and then Scott will wrap up with you. Um, yeah. I mean, really simple. My first new year's resolution goal is to take three times more pay time off than last year, you know, for guys <laughs> like Corey. <laughs> I was that, fun. that way he's got to approve it. Right. So, um, <laughs> And, and, and it sounds really like macho, but I, I'm going to honestly double down with what Corey said. If I did a repeat of what I did this year for next year, I'm extremely happy. Um, if there's a problem or an issue, I probably already took care of it days or weeks, uh, months ago. Like, I'm really happy with my life. We can all keep making those tweaks and dialing it in and getting a little bit better. Uh, I, I will agree with Corey. I somehow also need to be a little bit more empathetic, I think. Uh, <laughs> that's something that, uh, my wife is very empathetic. Uh, I, me, I have zero. I, I don't want to hear it. I don't care. I wanted it done two weeks ago. And in fact, I shouldn't even have to tell you that it should have been done two weeks ago. You should have knew that, right? So I got to work on some of that kind of stuff. Um, but I think that's what happens when you're trying to drive and trying to push the needle forward. And that, that's just, you know, kind of typical business owner stuff. Um, I think, honestly, uh, I, one thing that I want to do is work on physical fitness and health. Um, you know, we talk about balance and unbalance. I was a little unbalanced with, uh, you know, a couple of things showing up and I'm like, what is this? You know, this like little gobbler thing and then a little, a little pooch, you know, I look like Pooh Bear this year, but uh, I think we're going to work on that this year uh, a little bit more. I got to get an action plan and, and a game plan, but 
the other kind of facet scenario of my life I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy with um but that was after working at them like intentionally for three or four years so i don't you know it's you know honestly like new year's goals they've they turned into like a joke if we're just honest like it's almost the running joke two years from now everybody says new year's goals that's stupid i want more ice cream so it's like if you have a culture in a society that treats new year's resolutions like that anyway you know it's like <clears throat> why even bother set them i i I love with uh, what Blake said. This is the last thing I'll say. I love what Blake said. He said, an apology means like you're absolutely uh, owning up to it and you're sorry, you're sincere. Well, like commitment is the exact same way. It's like, it's like a covenant, like Scott was saying. You know, you have to commit to it day in, day out. Like it, a resolution is, it's resolute. And that doesn't mean two weeks from now, you're fair weather. Oh, it snowed, I'm not going to run. Uh, <laughs> oh, you know, my wife and I had a fight. I'm not going to tell her I love her. Right. So I would just say, like, stop waiting for these like New Year's resolutions and just decide every single day to start making incremental changes and and let that gain some momentum for a few years. And you'll wind up like the Corey Ballards with big, successful businesses. You know, that's that's not overnight. And, and Corey just gave the, the answer and half the people probably missed it. It's not any one grand thing he does to be successful. It's those little daily decisions that compounded over 20 years. Now you're the guy to point to and you all want to be like him, like myself included, but it wasn't any one thing Corey did, you know, on January 1st, back in 2004, come on. It's all those little decisions he's made every single day and real recognizes real. And that's what I want to be like. Mm -hmm. So that's just what I got to keep reminding myself of. That's really cool, Brian. That's really cool. Well, well said, man. Well said. Before we go over to Blake, let me just tell our audience Brian is a killer and there's two ways to flex on people. You can pull your shirt up and flex your abs or you can show your Tesla. So he's flexing with a Tesla. So anybody that gives him a hard time otherwise. All right, Blake, on to you, man. New Year's resolution. Uh, not necessarily not necessarily a resolution, more like some goals that I have set. Um, it, you know, Brian joked about it, but I am going to take more paid time off. You know, I'm going to take more time with the family. I already planned some you know, week trips and some extended, you know, weekend trips. Um, and when I'm, when I'm here uh, at the office, I, I, I know I'm going to kill it because I'm focused. And so, uh, but I am going to enjoy that time with them and, and, and some time away. And I'm excited about that. And it's neat to see the heart and the mind change finally to be excited about that because there was years where I couldn't even focus on that. And so I'm definitely um, super humbled and excited to, to have that heart and passion towards them um, that I have. And so I'm going to take full advantage of it. Um, company wise, we're, we're stay, sticking to what we do best, small landscapes, small lawn maintenance, but I am going to be helping my brother grow our company, um, uh, for, uh, turf control, uh, for evergreen turf control, for weed control, fertilization, uh, insect control. So we're going to be, we launched it a year and a half ago. Uh, we've got like 60, 70 clients. And so we're going to really try to just, you know, just, uh, kill it this next season. And so I'm excited about helping him with that and, and growing that together. Um, I would say besides that, I've got some debts that I want to pay off. Um, I'm real good about setting goals with debts and just, you know, um, going out and killing it. So I've got some big things, big ticket items, uh, excavator, um, machinery, maybe the wife's rig, um, that I'm sitting in, like some things like that, some personal debt, some, some business debt go out and, uh, and knock those out. And so, um, but all in all, you know, I'm just, I want to, I want to make the most out of, out of 2021, you know, people sit here, talk and complain about 2020, but I'll be honest, I've been super blessed. Uh, it's been a great year for us. Great year for my marriage, great year for my company, great year for me personally. Um, just, uh, to finally make the leap, put myself, you know, make, make the decision to put myself on payroll for the first time ever to make the decision to take some me time, uh, picked up the hobby of bow fishing. I may have got a little carried away about two, two rigs and stuff like that. But, you know, I splurged a little bit with that stuff, buying toys for the first time ever, but I know Brian can relate. I, I've, I've seen, I've seen the post and, uh, but it's nice to reward ourselves like that. And, um, that the nights on the water, you know, kids would go to bed. I'd go out on the water and I'd spend some time I'd watch the sunrise and just being able to completely disconnect um, gave me that mental clarity. So when I came home, I could turn the switch off. And I want to take more advantage of that yeah. um, this next year. So, you know, that's the big thing is being able to, when I am there, being fully present, not just physically 
likely be in there. And that's in everything. When I show up in the office, giving them 110%. When I get home, giving them 110%, um, you know, in every area of my life, um, going all in and not just being there to appease somebody, you know, executing and getting the most done that I can. That's awesome, Blake. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing, man. No doubt. Be, be where your feet are. All right, Scott Riley, New Year's awesome. Resolution 2021. Man. These guys covered a lot. You know, I just, for me, I just want to, it's not necessarily about a new year's resolution. You know, I want to continue to grow. And um, like Blake said, in different areas of my life, in all the areas, spiritually, with the family, uh, putting good stuff in my mind, take care of my body. Uh, but I want to become a better leader, grow as a leader, to, to, to better influence others and just to hopefully um, make a difference in our staff, our customers, in my family, uh, just make a difference, you know, and uh, just continue to try to treat people the same way I'd want to be treated. And this is not anything that that's that's like January the first. I'm starting this. This is something that I that I you know the foundation that's kind of in my blood, in my DNA. That's just how I want to. That's how I want to treat people. And I want to continue to run a run a hopefully a healthy, good business and treat people right and. You know, I'm, I'm looking forward to 2021. I know you guys are. And, uh, you know, that's uh, that's pretty much it. Awesome, man. That's awesome. Well, guys, I want to uh, say thank you first and foremost for uh, being on the panel. I know our audience is better for it. And before everybody leaves this massive conference room, this virtual conference room, I want to say the most important things here and give each one of these guys a shout out and how you can reach out to them. These guys are all giving back to the community in huge, massive ways. So go and support them and what they're doing. All right, so Scott Riley, look him up on IG Forever Green. Go look up Forever Green Scott Riley on Instagram. You can find Blake Hawthorne. Just type in at It's His Turf, Blake Hawthorne on Instagram. You can do the same with Corey Ballard. Look up Ballard Innovative Products or Ballard Products, and you can pretty much find that guy anywhere. And Brian Fullerton, look up Brian's Lawn Maintenance on YouTube. Little, You'll have to scroll down a little bit, but you can find him there and Google him, <laughs> Instagram, wherever. But hey, do me a big favor. These guys are being so nice and joining me and adding value to you. So go support them and what they're doing. Reach out to them, further the conversation and uh, further the community. So guys, thank you for being with us and uh, sure to appreciate it and hope you had a uh, happy new year. Great. Thanks for having me. Thank Adios. you. See you. Take care, guys. Um, appreciate it, guys. Bye now. See ya. what's up Hoss? you still on here i'm still on here bro at forever green 2001 that's 2000, my handle 2001 yeah it, it's cool forever green is there another forever green hey did you hear blake him and his brother have a forever green he texts me after the first pro paddle which he's 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 not even in our okay I was like, am I hearing something or am I just <laughs> mentally thinking that I have to say forever green? Cause I was like, what? Yeah. Yeah. So, so he texted me after the first pro panel. He said, man, I probably should let you know. And I was like, oh, it's cool. It's cool. But <laughs> yeah. So he's got a, a forever green too. Oh which, my gosh. What I'll, I think what I'll is, have to do is start saying like, Hey, in, in each of my posts, yeah, I've tagged each guy and then I'll, I'm going to put your, uh, your handle in the show notes. Cause that's hilarious. Awesome cool man hey man i appreciate it Have a good time hey yep hope have you guys a good are, one man hope you guys are doing well out there see you boss all right man have a good new year's eve yep. be safe uh, you too